Welcome to the podcast today where we celebrate innovation for a happy planet. I am your host, Abigail Carroll. When you think about Google, ocean innovation may be the last thing that comes to mind. But former Google CEO Eric Schmidt and his wife Wendy have been great friends to the ocean and climate, pouring millions into the sector through the Schmidt Family Foundation. Our guest today is Mark Schrope. He is the director of Schmidt Marine Technology Partners, an offshoot of the Schmidt Family Foundation. Schmidt Marine Technology Partners is dedicated to what they call venture philanthropy in the marine sector. In other words, without taking equity, they fill an important funding gap in marine innovation that we've heard about in many prior episodes. When traditional VCs and grants aren't available, they can step in. One example of tech they funded is fishing light technology, where attaching certain colored lights to fishing gear can reduce bycatch in wild fisheries with great efficiency. The very early stage research of this type of company may not be investable, but its potential impact is huge. That's where Schmidt Marine can step in. Let's jump to the podcast. Welcome to Happy Planet, Mark. Hi there. Thanks for having me. You are here from Schmidt Marine Technology Partners, which is part of the Schmidt Family Foundation. Correct. Can you tell us a little bit about Schmidt Marine and how it fits into the general architecture of the Schmidt Family Foundation? The network gets a little confusing at times. There's a variety of programs and groups that the Schmidts fund. Our program is part of, as you said, the Schmidt Family Foundation, which covers a pretty wide range of topics, all sort of focused on humans' relationship to the planet and hopefully improving those relationships. There's an energy program, Human Rights. They founded the Schmidt Ocean Institute now many years back, and they had also been through other endeavors supporting development of some marine technology. Mm -hmm. And that was sort of where our program came from. So through some of those efforts, they had supported some things like Sail Drone, which is a successful surface drone company, Open ROV, and a few other things. And I think they were kind of drawn to this idea that some of the needs in the ocean could be met through commercial entities, through groups that could produce tools that are needed to solve ocean problems and to accomplish some things that need to be accomplished in the ocean, ranging from conservation to research. And of course, there's plenty of crossover for that. So uh, that realization is what led to the idea of Schmidt Marine Technology Partners, this group that would fund the development of technologies to solve ocean problems and all with sort of an eye toward market forces, creating things that could go out into the world in large numbers and be produced in a way that would be kind of economically sustainable, you know, as products, as opposed to perpetually philanthropically supported things. That started in 2015. I came on soon after that. How's it going? I think it's going well. There's a lot to do. The ocean is still not fixed. So there's lots of work to do, but we have funded at this point over 60 projects over this, wow. that span of time. We're not developing the things ourselves. We're providing the support. We're the background support to the people that actually have the great ideas and do the hardest work. But we try to do that over the long term. So many of the things that we started funding at the very beginning in 2016, we still fund and we expect to fund things for between five and seven years. And I should note also that we do support in various ways plenty of for-profit entities, but we also support professors at universities that are working on ideas that could eventually be spun out or licensed out or go out into the world in that way. And we also support some nonprofit groups that are developing the kinds of uh, technologies or ideas or services that are in line with our mission. So you have an interesting background. You're a scientist by training. I was, but I wasn't a very good scientist. <laughs> so you were a journalist. If you, if you can't do the science, write about the science. Is that it? Yeah. So I started out in oceanography, which I obviously I still love, but I had a great job. I got to do, you know, expeditions around the world studying uh, or I was supporting the people that studied deep ocean carbon cycling. So interesting work, but I don't have the attention span to spend decades studying the same narrow sliver of something. The beauty of journalism was that it allowed me to 
study lots of different things. And you could dig in really deep, which I love, but then depending on how long the article was, days or weeks later, you move on to something else. You let other people do things for 20 or 30 years. And then when they finally make that big discovery, you swoop in and enjoy it and then move on to something else. So that was good. That seemed like a much better fit for me. And now you sort of get maybe a little bit in the middle, right? Yeah. I have really always thought of what I do now being very similar to journalism. So looking for projects is a lot like looking for stories. You're just trying to track as many things as you can and meet as many people as you can and find the most interesting things. And then just like with an article, once we find a good project or a good team, we kind of dig in and we start to do research and we try to learn as much as we can about that area. We talk to experts in that area. All those things are the same. And then at the end of it, our job is to translate it all into really clear terms a lot like getting the article written, you've got to talk to the board and you've got to talk to other people to try and get them interested. So it seems like a natural transition with a lot of similarities. Your website talks about a term that I hadn't heard before, venture philanthropy. Can you tell me what that means and how that applies here? For us, what I think it means is that we are a philanthropic program. So obviously we have no profit motive other than we want to seek companies succeed so they can do the work they need to do. But we borrow a little bit from VC groups. And specifically to me, the most important thing, there are sort of some negatives when it comes to philanthropy and conservation from venture capitalism in the sense that for the most part, their goals are kind of short term, right? They have a five-year fund and they need to make a company, help it become as big as it can be, as valuable as it can be at the five-year mark so that they get their return, right? It's not that they're against long-term stability. That's just not their vested interest. Right. So of course, as a philanthropy, we're the opposite. Our vested interest, our primary goal is to create things that will have a long life, that are going to go out into the world and do the good work that they need to do over the long term. But the piece that I would say we borrow is venture capitalists don't just throw money at a group, not if they're a a good VC firm, right? right? They come in and they really partner with the companies. They recognize that they're working with oftentimes founders who have very limited experience, need a lot more help besides money. If you could build a successful company or create a successful conservation technology just by throwing money at it, then this would all be quite easy and there'd be a lot more wealthy VC people out there. It takes a lot more than that. It takes a lot of other kinds of support. And so we certainly can't claim to be there yet. We haven't provided the level of support that you see from some VCs, but that's what we're going for is we want to be able to provide not just the money, but business help, counting help, communications help, all these other things that go into making a successful company. So generally, Schmidt Marine does not take equity in these companies. You're putting money into them to support the very early stages when they are unable to have a product in market yet. Is that correct? That is correct. Yes. We do not take any equity stake and that's not our goal. We find other ways, sometimes creative ways to support. There's more restrictions, put it mildly, on what we can do in support of for-profits. I mean, it all comes down to charitability. We have to make a solid case that what we're supporting is charitable. Most of the groups we work with, they're clearly doing charitable things, even if they're for-profits, so we can do that. I should note the foundation does have an impact investment program that we work with, and so that would be more traditional investment. But that's something that we hope to help some of our groups get to, but it's not the main focus for us. There's only been, out of those 60-some-odd projects we've funded, only one of them so far, the investment program has invested in. That's not the primary goal. So what are some of the themes? What are the big problems you're trying to solve in the ocean today? For us, when we look at how we focus from the start, we've tried to focus on areas that seemed like the biggest gaps. Over time, we've, we've, we've tried to do a little more sort of narrowing down to things that are gaps in the sense that there are less people willing to fund it, but also things that seem like a good fit for our model. Things, you know, the network we've already built is going to be especially helpful. And things that are on the list of the top issues on the ocean side. So for us, we've pulled out a couple of key things. Usually we keep it on a rolling basis and we're Mm -hmm. talking to people all the time that are doing work in any of the focus areas that we have. But twice we've had more focused calls for proposals. So one of those was coastal nutrient 
pollution, so the pollution that's driving all kinds of algae blooms and fish kills and that sort of thing in coastal waters all over the world. And then fisheries. Uh, that's the more recent call for proposals that we've done over the past year where we're looking to fund new technologies that can uh, significantly improve the sustainability of fisheries. So things like bycatch reduction or better tracking, a whole range of things. I'm working with um, a company that's actually doing something very similar to one of the companies in your portfolio. It's a light-based technology that's in the fishing gear that attracts and detracts certain fish. Who would have thought that an idea so simple could have such great efficiencies? Are you finding that a little bit? I mean, you need the time to do that type of research, right? Those are really um, out-of-the-box ideas that seem somewhat simple to implement. Is that what you're doing? Is it really just trying to let people have enough creative freedom to get kind of funky with the ideas? Yeah. In fact, we just had a, an offsite retreat where we talked a lot about risk. You know, there's no magic formula for it. There's always going to be gray areas. But we do very much try to encourage people to pursue risky ideas with major payoffs. And the lights in fishing are an example I use a lot because, to be completely honest, the first time I saw it, I didn't think much of the idea. Not because I didn't like the idea in general, but I just didn't really believe that you could have a significant impact by placing lights. But then I saw the data, and I, as part of our diligence, when we started funding that, which goes way back, we talked to some of the scientists that were doing the study. They were people that weren't attached to any of these companies that were doing independent research. It was pretty amazing. It takes work to do these things, and as much as it's another area where you have to balance because you want these things to happen fast, right? Yeah. If the lights work, we want them in every net right. tomorrow. That's not going to happen. The needs are urgent, but it still takes a while to develop things. And so you have to balance that and try to provide the right level of support to at least help it go as fast as it can. You mentioned the coastal nutrient pollution challenge. You know, I had an oyster farm. I was became very acutely aware of that. And now in Maine, they're actually finding PFAS chemicals coming down, and mm -hmm. there's concern that that's getting into the shellfish. What are some of the projects that you're seeing in that space? Another thing I try to be really cautious about saying whenever I'm talking about these things is that we don't imagine that we can fix everything with technology, right? It's just a sliver of what needs to be done that comes with technology. There's also politics, and there's human behavior, and those things are a lot harder to solve and so all of that comes into play with coastal pollution, right? So I live in Melbourne, Florida. So we live very close to, to what's called Indian River Lagoon. Sadly, has gotten a lot of national and international attention lately because we've had all kinds of fish kills. More recently, our manatees were dying off, and all of this ties directly back to the coastal pollution. If you have a, a mansion on the water, you don't have to have a lush green lawn that goes straight to the water line, right? There's things that we can solve in other ways. But... It's also not nearly that simple because even when you're doing things well, there's still issues. We have lots of people with septic systems. You know, we need alternatives to that. There's wastewater treatment plants that need to be upgraded. There is, there's a lot of mess already in the lagoon, and that's the same in a lot of places. You already got too much nutrients as well as some of these other toxins like you're talking about that are locked up in the sediment. You got to try to get rid of some of that muck. So it's a very complicated issue, but I think there's certainly progress being made. We've talked to people that have some really creative solutions for septic systems. We've funded one and talked to others that are looking at materials that you could either deploy in the environment to encourage the bacterial growth that's needed to eat up more of the nutrients before it gets into the main waterways, or that can also be applied in wastewater treatment plants where that's one of the problems is nitrogen and phosphorus are invisible, right? So you can have water that looks like it's really clean coming out of a wastewater plant, but that's still high in these nutrients. So long way to go, but we look at that as another really important piece of this. In fact, when we did our coastal pollution initiative, we had another group of advisors that was helping us frame how we would set that initiative up and was almost a little surprised how often monitoring came back. And the reason is the monitoring is so inadequate now. So to stick with the example of Indian River Lagoon, where I live, we actually have very strong bipartisan support for solving the problems because everybody 
has problems when we lose this. Whether you're a fisherman, whether you have a hotel on the waterway, whether you eat fish, whatever it is, we all have an interest in it. And there's money because of that. But the problem is the list of things that are involved is long and everybody argues about what's the highest priority and then you end up just splitting it in a bunch of different ways. One of the reasons for that is because we don't have adequate data to really pinpoint what the worst problems are. If we had a really good network of sensors in that lagoon and in all these other lagoons that face the same problems, we would come a lot closer to being able to say, well, this is the top problem, let's tackle this first, or let's tackle these top three. But because we don't have that, the sensors that we have that work are really expensive. So that's one of the things that we've funded in a couple of different ways is it's got to be low cost. You've got to get these things down to where they're cheap enough. Right now, even groups that have significant funding, they might put a dozen or two dozen sensors around the lagoon, and that's not going to cut it. We need things that can be put out for one or 200 instead of 10 or 20 or 30 or $40,000. So that's an area we want to see some improvement. That's interesting. And so much of that testing is just done manual right now that it's so slow. I mean, in Maine, the whole coast, there's so much coastal waters that could be opened up for oyster farms and such, but they just don't have the human resources to go out there and test every nook and cranny. So if we could get some of that automated, it would help on so many levels. Automated and cheap. We got to make it easy. Yeah, I totally agree. We'll be right back to talk more about the growth of the blue economy sector and how optimistic Mark is about the future of the climate. A big thanks to the Maine Technology Institute, MTI, investing in innovation for a prosperous Maine. MTI is Maine's unique public-private partnership whose core mission is to diversify and grow Maine's economy by accelerating innovation in the state's targeted technology sectors. MTI offers grants, loans, equity investments, and services to support Maine entrepreneurs and organizations as they transform their innovative ideas into new products, services, and companies, leading to the creation of quality jobs for Maine people. For more information about MTI and its programs, please visit maintechnology.org. For a blue economy to thrive, people need to use more sustainable products. But which products? And will consumers actually adopt them? Innovators like you are hustling to figure this out. Spark number nine can tell you if there's demand for your product. Spark markets your product before it's built using online advertising so you launch smarter. Have a big idea? Vet it with Spark before you build. Visit Spark online at www.sparkno9.com or find them on LinkedIn. We're back with Happy Planet. I've heard about this funding gap from a lot of the entrepreneurs I've been speaking to. It seems like in China, especially, but even in Europe, the government's coming in and putting a lot of money towards the blue economy and ocean research. Why do you think there's such a shortage in the United States of this type of interest? Yeah, there's a lot of complicated economics, I think, in all of this, and it ties to the I mean, larger issues of our approach to science and technology in general in the U.S. But I do think that there is growing interest. I mean, of course, government support is is great, but there are other ways to do it. But that leaves opportunity for you guys to come in and for private philanthropy and private foundations to support these technologies. Why do you think that the Schmidt Family Foundation got interested in the ocean? Why is this critical? course, if you're going to try to accomplish something, you want to work in the places where there's a lot of room for major improvements, right? And I think they saw that the ocean was that way. Whenever I talk about this, I try to do it without saying any of the things that I hear over and over and that we make fun of sometimes when we're reviewing videos and things like that about oxygen and all. But the truth is that the ocean is absolutely essential to the way our planet operates if it operates well in terms of, you know, managing cycles and, you know, carbon cycles, nutrient cycles, all these things that are completely dependent on a healthy ocean to work properly. Humans, we depend on it for livelihood, recreation, you know, even people that are a long ways away from the ocean are receiving benefits that hopefully there's more recognition of, but whether they recognize it or not, the benefits are still there. So, I mean, it's just essential and it's, 
those things that we depend on are threatened by the current state of affairs. So Mm -hmm. we need to correct those where we can. Well, it seems like this whole blue economy is sort of following on the heels of the climate economy is getting wind in the sails. I'm kind of curious, does the Schmidt Foundation have a position on the whole carbon credit market? There's certainly collectively concern. I mean, it's all addressable concerns, but, you know, concerns, the the obvious that we don't want to create a situation where we make people think that they don't have to make these other changes because they're able to pay for reforestation or something along those lines. That's always a danger that we keep kind of front of mind. On the ocean side, though, it is something that we've talked a lot more. I think there's certainly merit to the argument that we need to do that plus rather than an either or situation. And there is growing interest in finding ways to tap into the ocean's ability to absorb carbon. But there's also an unfortunate history with some of the earlier stages of things like iron fertilization and how that was handled. I think the obvious thing to think or or look at here, especially on the ocean side, is that you've got to have solid research underpinning anything that you want to try to do, right? So you can't just jump in with an idea. It's not like creating a some kind of sensor in your garage, right? Before you test these things, we need to have the fundamentals down and we need to really understand what's involved there. So that requires, uh, I think, maybe a good bit more research underpinning a potential company or a potential new technology, maybe more than you would find in some other areas. So that's kind of a starting point for us. That's great. And have you seen quite a big evolution in the near 10 years that you've been involved in Schmidt Marine? Yeah, I would say to a shocking degree, in a good way, much more than I was expecting to see when we got got going with all this. There's a lot more funders that are looking at these areas. There is, there's a whole range now of incubators and accelerators, and they cover the gamut from more regionally focused efforts, you know, that are driven by the economic interests of a particular region onto the broader scale. I mean, we hope to see more of it, but I think that that has led to more people being interested in some of these areas. We would certainly like to encourage more really bright people with great ideas to apply their skills to solving ocean problems. But yeah, the growth has been pretty pretty amazing. And investment as well. I always kind of try to remember to note that we're in a privileged position because we have the support of a, an endowment. So we're able to do the work that we do without having to have that focus on profits back to us, which I recognize is not kind of right. the normal situation. But that said, when I talk to people and when I talk to groups, I do very much encourage people to look more at the earliest stages because I think that's where it's the most difficult. And you do have a lot more investors coming in, but I think sometimes they're surprised not to find more investable opportunities. And so it's, it's almost funny in a way. I my, What I always say is if there's been very little support for development in the early stages. I'm not sure how people imagine that hundreds of companies could be here in the investable stage. We need the whole ecosystem to make it possible to have a really good pipeline of companies available to the investors. Even if it's not funding, there's a lot of business knowledge that can be applied. Absolutely. I mean, there are these accelerators popping up all over the planet in the blue space. And so people like myself were doing a lot of mentoring, you know, and there's tons of angel investing. But I would tend to agree that the investable opportunities that are directly OSHA related are, for most investors, are few and far between. You need very patient capital and a high risk tolerance. That said, I agree, as the ecosystem grows, all the ships are kind of lifted. I also see that there seem to be a few categories that are getting a lot of attention. Like there are a lot of ocean monitoring devices that I'm seeing. And so I feel like there's a few themes. I'm sure you're seeing that. How do you pick who gets into your program? I'm assuming it's very competitive. We have a dartboard at the office. (laughs) Um, So we meet groups through a lot of different ways. We normally accept unsolicited proposals through a, you know, an easy bot on our website. We get out when there's not a global plague underway. We get out into lots of conferences. We meet with groups. We try to get to just areas where we know a lot is happening to see what's going on. And there's no one way that we find groups, but I guess the largest contributor would be networking. With the larger initiatives, we've done a little more advertising. So once we get them all in, it is very challenging, especially with like those initiatives. The last one we did, we had 200 
initial proposals that came wow. in. We whittle through, and there's a whole range of things that we are looking for. It's the stage of technology, what their needs are, and what we think we can do, and all of those things. But if it seems like it's even possibly a fit, then we'll ask for a full proposal. We try to keep our process very simple, so it's very accessible to as many people as, as possible. And if it still looks promising once we get the full proposal, then we start putting it out for external review. So we'll identify experts. Uh, we also work at different times, like with the fisheries panel, we brought in specific experts for different types of technologies, but we also had a wonderful panel of advisors that was helping us do the whittling. And so if, if it stands up to that scrutiny, if we take it to our board for approval and hopefully funding. And what kind of funding, what are some of the sums look like? <laughs> It's all over the place, depending on the stage and the complexity in general. Usually we're talking about grants between the 50000 and $500,000 range right. for a year. So what are some of the challenges that you guys have you know, in the role that you're playing right now? We have not achieved what we hope in terms of the support that we provide to the groups that we're working with. So that's always a challenge to find the ways to do that. There's a lot of areas where finding the right balance is important and is always going to be a challenge. It's not as simple as you throw twice as much money at something and it moves twice as fast. So you want to find the right levels for funding. I mean, we have obviously no shortage of people that are talking to us about things that they would like us to fund, but we are always looking for more great ideas. Part of that is just kind of getting the word out about what we do and getting people coming to us. But something else that I've wondered about whether, so risk is important, right? We need the right level of risk in what we can tolerate as a program. And we are in an incredible position, right? We need to be able to tolerate a lot of risk if the benefits justify it, and because we can take that on in ways that others can't. But we also need people that are thinking about risky things, right? And I think that can be a certain amount of chicken and egg, which comes back to the, we got to let people know and back it up with actual, you know, dollars that, hey, if you've got that idea you have that seems maybe a little too crazy, but that would transform how we're able to address a particular problem, like, let's talk, pursue that idea, and we'll help make sure that you can get the funding that you need to do that. And I, so I do wonder sometimes on our side, obviously, we need to keep thinking about what our risk tolerance, but I do wonder about kind of the collective risk tolerance of the marine tech community or the broader community of people that can address some of these things and provide them the support that makes it, makes it worth taking those kind of crazier risks with the big payoffs. Yeah, I mean, I've had a few people that I've spoken to where – the scale of what they need is enormous, right? If someone like that came to you and they've got like the $50 million project or the $100 million project, what do you tell them? Like, how do you help them get to that big kind of success, big, big capital? That's a long road. In the earliest stages, we can tell them that we can, well, under the right charitable circumstances, that we can provide the funding that's needed to begin to explore. We can help them tap into a network of investors and experts and, and all of those things that can help them get ramped up. And then ultimately, maybe we could imagine a time you know, where we go further down the line. But ultimately, what we say we're trying to do through our support is get people to the level where either they can be self-sufficient just through selling a product or a service, or get them to the point where their ideas have been de-risked enough that a more traditional investor, not yeah. necessarily the VC that wants the exponential growth, but a more traditional investor can step in. And then basically what we're trying to do is help them through the early stages and then sort of hand them off to that world and um, do everything we can to help them be ready for that world. But the harder challenge is the ones that are probably not ever going to get to the to the point where, where you're going to make Silicon Valley VCs happy, yeah. right? How do you balance the philanthropic support with the market forces that have to kind of come into play at some point to make, make a company successful. I've heard a lot of family offices are actually getting on board with patient money for some of these projects and that that's been very helpful. Absolutely. I would include that in the encouraging growth of interest in some of these things. I mean, people have different goals. I used to wonder what that balance was between market returns and environmental benefits and almost thinking of it as an either or but it's, there's a whole spectrum. So there's people that their thesis for investment calls for 
trying to show that you can get market returns from some of these things that also do good. And that's great. But there's also going to be some things that we need out in the world that are not going to make market returns. They can be successful and they can bring in money, but they're not going to make market returns. And personally, I think that's one of the best places for philanthropic investment is to make these things possible that wouldn't be possible under the normal forces alone. And I, it's great to see pe- people trying to do that. And it does. It's, they got to be really patient <laughs> because it does take a little while. Well, get out of our Instagram economy and uh, build some infrastructure. So what are the issues about the ocean that are closest to your heart? As much time as, as I can, I spend in the water. I like to dive. I do. I'm not really a fisherman, but I like to do things like lobstering in yeah. Florida and in the Keys. I've been around the water my whole life since as far back as I can remember I was snorkeling in places like the Keys I've seen what's happened my baseline may not be back to pristine but relative to what we have now there's a pretty massive gap especially when you look at these things like reefs in the Keys here in Florida hogfish is a favorite fish that people like to get through spear fishing and you know the fish were getting pretty small and they dramatically changed the rules. They increased the size by a third. So it went from a 12 inch being legal to a 16 inch fish being legal, which knocked out a lot of the fishing. And I mean, that 16 inches is is a monster for this fish, right? And so you thought, why you never see any that that big. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, not quite. Uh, That would simplify things. But anyway, I figured like people aren't going to be spearfishing at all because they're not going to find monsters like that. But within a year, wow, there's fish all over that are not that are the monster size, but between the previous limit and the new limit, you see tons of fish just in the space of less than a year. Feels like nature rebounds pretty quickly if you give it a chance. Are you optimistic about the future? Can we (laughs) we beat this? We can improve this. I like to think I'm pretty optimistic. I can also be a little cynical and curmudgeonly, but I do really think we are at a really interesting point in time for all of this, where we have some of these things coming together, growing interest among important categories, funders, and everything else. We have a lot of technology, and we see all kinds of amazing ideas for solving some of these problems. So in that sense, I am very optimistic that we are going to be able to make progress solving ocean problems at a level that hasn't been possible before. Yeah, I mean, there's also more of a global consensus. And yeah. that helps the momentum, I think. Any advice you have for entrepreneurs today who are in the climate or the specifically the ocean segment? I would say that it is, you know, all of these things we're talking about are very much could be in someone's good business interest to look at. And there's been a couple of reports over the past few weeks about how climate related technology is bucking the trends for other investment and other technologies because of the interest right now and everything. So in that sense, it can even be a good good business decision. But I think in general, I would suggest to people that they look at the balance between making big profits and doing work that you really enjoy and that you feel like is doing something good. But I would encourage people to seriously weigh the benefit side and let's get some really bright new folks working on these things. Well, thank you so much, Mark, for your time today. Yeah, well, thanks for having us. Always a pleasure to think about and talk about this stuff. Yeah, get the word out to lots of bright people to be working on this. Yeah, I'll do my best. I hope you enjoyed this conversation with Mark as much as I did. What a privilege to get the inside perspective on this powerful organization. Thanks to Mark's good work and the generosity of the Schmidt Family Foundation, this important funding gap is getting the attention it deserves. We can see that through their venture philanthropy, they play an important role in this evolving blue tech landscape of accelerators, VCs, and grants. I was happy to hear that Mark is optimistic about the future of the planet and his advice to entrepreneurs to pursue businesses with the greatest impact rather than the greatest profit seems to meet the moment. Of course, if you can make both happen, you might be able to retire into a career of venture philanthropy as did Eric Schmidt. Thank you for listening. Please follow Happy Planet wherever you listen and leave us a rating and review. It really does help new listeners discover the show. Happy Planet was reported and hosted by me. I am also the executive producer. The talented Dylan Hoyer is our producer and editor. Composer George Brendel Egloff created our theme music. 
learn more about my work and get in touch by visiting happyplanetpodcast.com. <laughs>